Welcome to Terrifying and Twisted. Do you want a brew? All right. Hey, up. How's it going? Oh, you've not missed us too much. Oh, God. Been a bit hectic, hasn't it? We apologise for the late episode. We do. Best thing is, we said right from the beginning when we started this podcast that we're very raw and real and we don't do pre-recorded. We've not got a library on a computer that's got episodes lined up waiting to be published. No. And unfortunately, we, we've got a family of three kids, one that's a teenager, <laughs> so things have been a bit hectic, aren't they? But... Yeah, really hectic. So if you're new to the podcast, like Carla says, what you hear is what you get. We don't do no fancy, no fancy noises or sketches. We're not, we're not a circus act. No, we just like to talk about the cases and chat a little bit of shit. Me and you, sat on us fishing chairs. Yeah, we're still sat on us fishing chairs. Still get the shit chair, by the way. For anyone that's listened from the beginning, I'm still on the shit chair. But yeah. Uh, so, welcome to episode 13. I'm Phil. And I'm Carla. Welcome to Terrified and Twisted. Where we just talk shit about serial killers. And murder. Indeed. And true crime. Talking of true crime, anyone else watch the new Sons, Son of Sam on Netflix? Sons of Sam, I think it's called. Yeah. I obviously knew about David Berkowitz before. Um, well, and I knew the Son of Sam story, but I didn't know about the other dudes that could possibly be involved. Well, I remember that night when you put it on, you actually said to me, I hope this gives me something that I don't already know. Yeah. Because that happens, doesn't it, when we watch some of these things, especially if it's a, you know, like Ted Bundy. Yeah, Ted Bundy, for example. There's that much stuff made on him. Yeah. That you're kind of just watching the same stuff over on repeat. So we watched that, didn't we? We did. It were all right. Yeah. No complaints. No, it were quite interesting, the connections. Yeah. Like you said, we, we had no idea about all that separate stuff, did we? I'm not sure about the connections and the other dudes, but... Yeah. <laughs> it is what it is, isn't it? Yeah. It's up to you to make your own mind up. So if you've watched it and you have got an opinion on it, let us know. Yes. And please, right, I feel such a knob. So when I put out on his Facebook page the other day, I'm trying to get it talking. I'm trying to get people talking on there. So I put the post out asking for any case requests. Mm. Not one person. (laughs) But yet we've got over 200 and odd followers, but not one person. So if you do, just please comment because it's only me and Phil. (laughs) We're not going to, you know, we're not going to bite. Apart from that, we had a really cool thunderstorm of a night, didn't we? Yes, we did. And I bet a lot of other people did. Yeah. That, well, those that listen around us. Um, God, that was, it was loud, wasn't it? And sadly, a little boy lost his life in Blackpool. He did. He got struck by lightning, nine years old, playing football. Such an awful accident. Yeah. You were saying you just couldn't get your head round. How would you cope with that? What You've got you, no blame. You've yeah, got nothing. You blame it on? It's awful. And I just, I hope they don't blame themselves. No one can ever, you could, you wouldn't have even, it's not a scenario that enters your head, is it? And apart from that, we've been watching Superstar. <laughs> yes, such a cringy little series on Netflix, but we just love it, don't we? Yeah. It's, it's almost that shit it's that good. it's good. <laughs> yeah. But we like it, we find it funny. But we like um, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, don't we? Yeah. And it's similar to that. Yeah. So, well, the humour is similar. We've also um, seen first few episodes of the new And Maze Tale. Tale. Yeah, we love And Maze Tale. If that's a series you've not watched... Watch it. Highly, highly recommend yeah. watching it. And then, lastly, <sighs> Fred West. Yes. This is all um, taking over news, isn't it, last few days? Well, week or so. I've um, read latest on it is I think they've got six parts of this cafe to dig up and yeah. have a look. Um, so for anyone who's not listening, what's happened? 
Oh. Right, so Fred, Fred West's son has apparently informed police that before he killed himself, he admitted to killing this girl, and this is where she is. Along them lines, um, so obviously police have gone and they're the digging it, they're finding areas of which they think may be suspicious, and they're going to dig it up. I'm not sure if they're going to find out. The last report I did read, police said that this case has always been a matter of <laughs> filtering out the facts yeah. from fiction because yeah. he spun them a shitload of lies. Yeah, so, so we'll see. We'll see how um, that pans out. Also this week, for a Monday as well, we reached over 1,000 downloads, didn't we? Yep. On two platforms. So we're quite impressed with ourselves for yep. that. Go fucking us. I know. Do you know what, though? It's mad because when we were on phone to Lee, I was saying, those first few downloads, they seem to take forever. Do you know, like, you're watching it build slowly and slowly. Mm. But then over the last few days, it just jumped. It was like we had a massive surge, and we went from, like, 980-something mm. to now we're nearly at, yeah, 1,100. So it's it's been pretty good. Impressive. Awesome. And I think we should be proud of ourselves. So there we go. Your first this week? I'm first. Who you got? My case is about a male called Chris Benoit. Now, this is a really strange case for me. Right. Because Chris Benoit was a wrestler. He wrestled in WWF. And WWE. That, that is all I know about this guy. Yeah. I know nothing else. This is how I know this guy. Right, well, can I just stop you right there? You remember how you said to me that he's a wrestler and you said Ben would enjoy that? Yeah. I messaged Ben about it and Ben straight said, is it this guy? And he sent the name. And I'll be honest, I said, I don't know because I don't know any, I can't remember what name Phil said, but all I know is he's a wrestler. So Ben has nagged the life out of me every day this week. When, when you When's your episode going on? When's Phil doing his episode? Because obviously Ben is a massive wrestling fan, isn't he? Yeah. As was I in my teenage years, I used to absolutely love wrestling. Yeah. Back to Hulk Hogan and Bushwhackers. And what are you talking about? You're 35 year old and you're still, if it's on. The Big Boss Man. I don't I don't watch it though, do I? I don't go out and wait No, to watch no, it. but what but I mean is. When you, I was younger, yeah. I did. Even to a point when my best mate. Dale at the time, we used to, every Friday, 10 o'clock, Rory's War, is what it was called, every Friday, have an Indian and watch wrestling. Used to, absolutely. Love it. So, <clears throat> Chris Benoit was born May 21st, 1967, in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. His parents was Michael Benoit, and for some reason I even wrote his mum's <laughs> name. <laughs> So, as Chris Benoit were growing up, he loved wrestling. He idolised Brett the Hitman Hart. Have you heard of him? Heard of him. I'm not. And uh, someone else called the Dynamite Kid. When Chris were 15, he met Dynamite Kid. Told him he wanted to be just like him. Flexed his muscles. <gasps> said, I want to be just like you. Um, Chris's dad encouraged him with his wrestling. Got him some weights. Um, got him training. He used to take him three hours to the Hart's family training area which was called the dungeon. Okay. God knows what they used to get up in up to in there, but I'm sure all was not as it seemed. <laughs> no, not that. It's just it's just a weird thing and wrestlers do train like mad. Right, okay. Like mad. Um Chris be began his career in 1985. He signed for someone called Stampede Wrestling. They were quite successful there. Won a few belts. Mm -hmm. In 1989, he went to Japan. Again, really successful. Had a few belts. Uh, in 1982, he joined WCW. Didn't on, didn't get on great there. And in 1994, he signed for ECW, which these are like the lower. So yeah. yeah. And then like UWF is like UFC. Right. Okay. In ECW, he was in a wrestling match and he broke. A wrestler's name called Sabus broke his neck Fuck as they yeah. were doing a move. The move went wrong and he ended up breaking this guy's neck. Chris allegedly were devastated by the thought of paralysing someone. Well, surely it was just an accident. Yeah. In ECW, more success 
a few more championship belts. And then something happened with his work visa renewal and he ended up being moved from there. He went to WCW again and he sort of flitted between WCW and Japan. Now when he were in WCW, he was doing well and there was a storyline where he was having an affair with this woman. Right. The backstage relationship between him and this woman got a bit more intense and it turned into a real right. affair. <clears throat> Chris had been married before, um, so obviously that marriage had broke down. He'd had two kids and then he's pretending to have an affair with this woman and it turns into a real affair. Yeah. While he's in WCW, again, really successful championship belts. In 1999, he had to do an Owen Hart tribute death and Owen Hart is the wrestler who was coming down from the ring. I don't know if you've heard about no. it. Coming down from the skylines on like a... Oh, I've not really seen the video, so I'm sh- assuming it's sort of like a zip line. Right. As he's coming down to the ring and he falls. Fucking hell. And, and ca- he died. Yeah. Right. Um, so obviously Chris were devastated about that. He was really close with Hart family. In 2000, he signed for the WWF. He was really successful in the WWF. And I mean... Really successful. Like massive. Yeah. Yeah. In 2001, he broke his neck and he was out for 12 months. In 2004, he won the World Heavyweight Belt at WrestleMania. Mm. WrestleMania is like... Huge, in it? It's, it's the, the thing. show yeah. for WWF. Now, I remember Chris Benoit and it's fake. Obviously, wrestling is fake. Yeah. But so much stuff that these guys do and so much things where they throw their bodies around. You've said to me many a times. Um, yeah, real. yeah. Not forgetting Chris Benoit, one of his special moves were a flying headbutt. So he used to get on the turnbuckle to the top and then literally fly. Well, not literally fly because he can't fucking fly, <laughs> but jump off and fly in a butt. Right. And the amount of times that he did that, he used to get into TLC matches, which is tables, ladders, and chairs. You're saying all these abbreviations. I'm going to be honest with you, right? Yeah, but other people listening might know what I'm on about. Right. I've just explained to you what TLC stands for. Yeah, but what about other things? Do I not need to know abbreviations for them lower level? No. Re- all right. I'm just telling you the amount of times that I've seen him jump off ladders. Was and impressive. And flying their butts and it was just crazy. Right. Right. So in November 13th, 2005... Chris Benoit's best friend, Eddie Guerrero, died of a heart attack from an enlarged heart. Right. Now, a lot of these guys did or didn't do steroids. Yeah. When there was in the WWF, WWE. But the, I think a lot of them take it not to get bigger, but to, to, to repair the bodies. Okay. Because the bodies are going through that much turmoil. Um, Chris, we're obviously devastated. There's a YouTube video where he's talking about Eddie Guerrero on the Raw show, and it's heartbreaking. You can you can see how yeah he, he, he tells him he loves him, and it's it's awful. Um, apparently, Chris started writing a journal to Eddie, so he felt like he was still talking to him. Yeah. Now I'm telling you all this for a reason. All this stuff. <laughs> okay. 2003, he lost his best friend Eddie. Now. Yeah. A lot of these guys that travel be- between themselves, like the WWE doesn't organise travel for the wrestlers, the wrestlers have to organise it themselves. All right. So these wrestlers in the WWF, they do like three to four live shows a week. So it's a lot of travelling. And they could be in completely different places. Yeah. Um, I, I read a stat that out of 365 days, these wrestlers were 300. Fucking hell. Yeah. So. so they're on the load, uh, on, on the load, on the road a lot with each other. That's obviously how him and Eddie were so close. And a lot of people have described Chris as a really nice bloke. Okay. Like they always do. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. An amazing wrestler. Really good at what he does. Yeah. Never seen him angry. Yeah. Never seen him upset. In 2003, his wife, Nancy, filed for divorce um, and got restraining order on Chris for alleged cruel treatment. Right. Which will have been really strange to everybody else. Yeah, and his anger problems, uh, it were alleged he had increased paranoia, um, 
Chris thought he was being stalked. Um, he'd never take the same route home. Yeah. But we don't know if it was the increased drug usage that maybe yeah. after Eddie had died, he was in a bad place. Now, him and Nancy had a son together called Daniel. Um, like I said, the superstar superstars comments, and we're talking about some of the biggest names, names Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah. The, the trusting with the lives, with the kids, loving Well, you've just, you've just said out of a year, the work 300. So they spend more time yeah, they know, with they those know, wrestlers, with each other, than they, they do the families. Him, they know him, that's what. Yeah. Um, never seen him angry. He was quiet, really intense, technical wrestler, push you to be his best. Push you to be your best, sorry. So <clears throat> Tuesday 19th of June, 2007, Chris Benoit wrestles his last match. And wins. He does uh, a diving headbutt. Yeah. And allegedly this headbutt lands on his opponent's knee. Now, one thing I have seen on YouTube about Chris Benoit is I can't remember what happened. I think it was one of these flying headbutts. Mm. And you can see him fit in the fucking ring. Hell. Yeah, he has a fit. It's crazy. Yeah. Proper fucking dangerous. Yeah. Um, on Friday, 22nd of June, Chris Benoit rushes home for a family emergency. And also on Friday, 22nd of June, Chris Benoit kills his wife. Fucking hell. Apparently, Chris strangled her. She was found with her feet bound and her wrist bound. And all they know is that she died of asphyxiation sometime on that Friday. Right. Then Chris kills his son, Daniel, on the Fucking Saturday. Fucking hell. Daniel but... apparently had um, drugs in his system and was strangled while he was asleep well that poor little boy drugged while his dad killed his mum so he didn't wake up and hear it but i am i don't know what's coming i don't know what's happened what's triggered it but all i'm going to say is from how much of a massive star he was how many people knew him and knew how much of a good guy he was this is completely out of fucking character yeah massively so the sunday chris commits suicide Fucking hell. Um, he commits suicide by hanging himself in his weight room. So do you know, like, um, one of the things that you put, put your lap pole down? Yeah. Apparently he'd hooked that up so he could oh. hang himself on the lap pole down. Now, they said that they also found copies of the Bibles next to the bodies of the wife and son, and then a third copy next to Chris. Now, Chris wasn't religious. We're religious. But Eddie Guerrero was massive. Right, religious. okay. Two days before, it's alleged that Chris Benoit's ex-tag team partner had just committed suicide as well. So this lo- this bloke has gone through a fucking lot, hasn't he? Yeah, but listen to this. Chris Benoit, when they do um, toxicology or... Oh, right, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. Autopsy. Autopsy, that's what, that's what I'm trying to say. Chris has got an enlarged heart also. Again, drug use, steroids. They reckon... And he was fitting, doing his head butt. They reckon that he may have been dead in 10 months. Anyway. Anyway. Now, what is crazy is Benoit's brain tissue showed severe CTE, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy to all the to all four lobes of the brain and its stem so his brain was that bad it was compared to an 85 year old dementia patient wow and i'm assuming that all them years wrestling and doing his flying head but has accumulated they alleged that he'd had over 300 concussions wow so such as damage to benoit's brain he was on course for early dementia there's no no telling um what his mind were like at the time uh, well i think it's fair to say that his mind wasn't of a normal state when he did what he did because it was so out of character yeah you know the, he's been a, a fucking famous wrestler for all these years not one person said they ever saw him angry yeah. he would never so this in a heated row that that's got out of hand and he's killed her like there was, he's swiped I, his whole family out i can remember when this first came out and there were stupid stuff like oh chris benoit had done his finishing move on his son because, oh no because one of his finishing moves were called a cripple across face and it's sort of like as your hands under your neck and pulls your head back right but I think that was just bullshit. Yeah. Um, well, no one's ever going to know either. Let's uh, be honest. It's all chuffing speculation. I'm not sure I understand. Sorry, that one we I watch. <laughs> I didn't ask you out. Yeah, so obviously speculation were massive. Yeah. Uh, steroid abuse, roid rage. 
obviously he had lost his best friend, he'd lost his tag team partner. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately this tragedy has happened and It's literally took his whole family. Yeah. And funnily enough, the next day WWE held a special for Chris Benoit. Yeah. And obviously everyone were devastated in the WWE. The next day it co- it came out that Chris had obviously murdered his family and WWE completely went shut down. Cut ties. Cut ties Complied. with Chris Benoit completely. He's basically erased from WWE. And that is the case of Chris Benoit. It's been a it's been a weird one for me, weird oh, nostalgia because I used to watch this guy. It was your re- childhood. Yeah, I used to watch this guy wrestle and he was amazing. Yeah. And he was aggressive and intense and just not scared of putting his body through. Well, look Obviously at... what he went through. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, his, his brain must have been like fucking scrambled egg. Yeah. I know that sounds awful to say. No, but something's happened, hasn't it, that's, that's triggered this because... How many... They must have been together years, him and his wife. Yeah, well. Wow. It's sad, isn't it, that? Really sad. What is it with these cases? Normally we sit here and we're calling him a piece of shit. The, you yeah, know. because at the end of the day, he did, he did murder his wife and kid. Yeah, and it was an awful fucking thing. I will thing. say there's theories out there that Chris didn't do it and other people did it. You'll never know what happened in that house. No. Now, I listened to Stone Cold say a few minutes on Chris Benoit. And Stone Cold Steve Austin is obviously massive. Yeah. Still is. Um, and he said, Chris Benoit, as the wrestler, one of the best men he's ever met. Yeah. Chris Benoit, and what he did in that house, could never be forgiven. Yeah, which, no. And that's ex- that's expected. That's what you would, you'd say it about anybody. Like, last, last case, I kid you not, that Robert stuck in my head. Well, you know, I'm currently fucking corresponding with Wakefield Prison to get his yeah. up-to-date prison number because I've I've wrote to him. Yeah. Um, yeah, what he did were wrong and he deserves to be where he is. Same as, you know, what, what this guy's done is fucking awful. But I don't think the, the cold-blooded killers, they're not in the same league as some of the absolute monsters that we cover. Well, what if I put it, what if I put it to you like this? What's the difference between him and Chris Watts? <laughs> no, fuck off. Because Chris Watts killed his wife. No, and kid. right. So, do you want me to tell you why it's different? I know why it's different, but I want to hear it from you. Because Chris Watts is a fucking piece of shit that only did what he did so he could get away with his affair yeah. and completely start a new life. So instead of doing the grown up manly thing to do and leaving your wife, sought custody with your children, no. I'll fucking kill you all. Not only will I kill you all, but I'll kill your mum first, put a dead body in back at car while I drive my two daughters, which are alive, by the way, over an hour away with a mum's dead body in the back of the fucking car. I'll then bury her. I'll then take one child and let the other one watch while she then says, please, daddy, no, don't, while he puts his blanket over her head. That's the fucking difference. And then dumps them in oil fucking tanks. For anyone listening, that's how... You wind Carla up and watch her go. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking good one. What um, a piece of shit he is, though. Yeah, we really despise, despise him. Um, so, like we're saying, for me, it's been a, it's been a weird case because I knew what th- this had happened because obviously it happened two thousand and seven. Sorry, as spring has been an absolute cock. Um, it was a really weird case for me to do. It, it fetched back a lot of memories from my childhood. I can imagine. And I just... It's a, it, a piece of shit because he killed someone. But I can't help but just feel sad about this case. Yeah. Like Robert Maudsley. Like other people. I think I think as individuals, you sort of... There's certain cases that stick with you. And then there's some that you feel yeah. like that. You've just seen that i fucking passionate about my hate for Chris Watt. And I don't use that word very often. Yeah. My mum always taught me that it takes a lot of effort to hate somebody. Yeah. But that's the kind of level he gets me to. Whereas there's some people out there, and you know it, because in fact I actually put a fucking status about it, idolise the dickhead <laughs> and write to him. Yeah. And in fact, hashtag Chris Watts is innocent. He fucking admitted it. What more do you need? But anyway. Everyone's got an opinion. 
Like assholes. Yeah. So, we're back in the room. Just had to sort kids out for school. We did. In that meantime, I've managed to show Carla a few Chris Benoit videos. Wow. <laughs> I can I can understand just see how big he was. Yeah. You also told me an interesting fact that you forgot to mention. Yeah, that he sent a few texts out um, saying that side door was open through the garage, the dogs were locked away. So basically for someone to find them. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So shall I tell you my story? Well, yeah, go on then. <laughs> so this is the story of a young girl called Sylvia Likens. I'd started this story ages ago. There were an episode where I said to you, I struggled. I think it was after the junk home. Right. I struggled to find a case. And I started this, but it reminded me a bit of the junk home, so I put it down. But last week I was having a coffee with Kerry and she mentioned a film she'd watched and it sounded really familiar. And when I had a look, it's actually a film that's been made about this. Right. So. And have we seen said film? Nope. Right. But I've not mentioned it until I've done this case. Cool. So, Sylvia Likens was the third of five children who was born to carnival workers, Lester and Elizabeth Likens. Now, Sylvia were born between two sets of twins. There was Diana and Daniel, who were two years older than her. Then she were born, and then Jenny and Benny came one year later. Her parents, for a living, basically followed the carnivals yeah. around. They had a stand, they sold sweets and drinks and whatnot, which meant they weren't very well off at all, struggled quite a bit. It also meant that they moved a lot. Yeah, so they don't have many friends. Not many. Now, when they travelled through summer, they'd often take the youngest son, help her more money, but they didn't like taking Sylvia and Jenny because of the safety concerns of it. Now, when I... There, there was just stuff said about children, people went missing and people ran off with other carnival families. So I think it was just a right. safety concern. So the two girls would stay with family members, mainly the grandma. So they could stay in the same school and finally make some friends. Now, in her teenage years, Sylvia knew that her mum and dad struggled. It was quite an open thing. She'd try and earn a bit of money babysitting, doing cleaning for people but she'd always give it to her mum. Everyone always described her as a really confident and friendly girl. When is this, sorry? This is in 1965. Right, yeah. So in June 1965, <laughs> the family had finally settled and they were living in Indianapolis. Yeah. Where their mum would later be arrested for shoplifting and she was sent to prison. But they still needed to earn some money. So Lester arranged for Sylvia and Jenny to stay because of the safety concerns. Now, like I said, they'd normally stay with Grandma, but this time he'd arranged for the girls to stay with a lady called Gertrude Benizuski. Right. Now, <laughs> Gertrude was the mother of two girls that the Jenny and Sylvie went to school with. Right. So Paula and Stephanie were 17 and 15. Like I said, they were Gertrude's daughters. And she also then had John, who was 12, Marie, who was 11, Shirley at 10, James at 8, and a baby that were a few months old called Dennis. Fucking hell. Right? How many kids? So, <clears throat> Gertrude was the first out of six kids. When looking, there's not much about her upbringing, which is always annoying, but there's not much on it. I did find that she actually watched her dad die suddenly of an heart attack when she was just 10. Then six years later, she decided to drop out of high school to marry John Stefan Benizuski, who was 18 at the time. They then went on to have four kids. So four of them are John's. It's said that John, it could be quite volatile. Um, it's rumored that he often beat Gertrude and stuff like that. They were together for 10 years. Then they decided to get a divorce. Gertrude went on to then marry a man called Edward. Yeah. But that lasted Three months, that ended. Three months of marriage? Yeah. She then divorced him and then remarried John, the first husband. Yeah. They then went on to have two more children before they finally got divorced in 1963. So not long after that third divorce, she started a relationship with a gentleman that was 22 year old called Dennis. He physically abused her. She also then had a son with him, but 
not long after she gave birth, he fucked off. Didn't want anything to do with the baby. So by 1965, Gertrude lived as a single mother to seven kids. Yeah. She was 36 year old and everyone described her as a haggard, underway, asthmatic chain smoker who struggled with depression. Right. So Sylvia and Jenny moved in to their family home on the 4th of July. The dad and brother off the went, travel at carnival, mum's in prison. Lester, the dad, had came to an agreement that for Gertrude taking care of his kids, he'd pay her $20 a week. Yeah. And obviously in these days, there weren't internet banking and stuff like that. So when the girls moved in, everything were all right. First few weeks, things were going good. Um, the kids were getting on. The girls would pull the weight with house old chores. Well, there were enough kids to do chores. Yeah, but what I mean is like Sylvia and Jenny didn't just <clears throat> go there and think they could live there and yeah. be waited on hand and foot. They chipped in and stuff. But then as weeks rolled into a month, the money started getting later and later. So Gertrude started to get a bit pissed off, basically. She'd start taking her frustrations out on two girls and she started beating them with random items. She'd make statements to them, scream in the face that she's basically taking care of you little bitches for weeks for nothing. She she used to use a paddle and it said that she would have, the girls would be covered. In bruises. Yeah. Now, Paula, the daughter, once accused the sisters of eating too much food at a church supper. So when they got home, Gertrude battered them for, is it gluttony? Yeah. Because Gertrude and the family were churchgoers. They went... I've got fucking gluttony. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> Um, but by the August, Jenny sort of merged in and Sylvia was the one that Gertrude had focused all this abuse on. Right. And she'd often abuse her, torture her, manipulate her, do really just shitty stuff. But it used to be after school and then on a weekend. And she'd always do it where no one could suspect anything. And these girls never said anything either to anybody, which were really odd. A lot of these... Well, they were probably scared because if they get took out of her house... Where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? Mm. Now, a lot of these attacks sort of were motivated by jealousy and it was very much tit for tat. Silly things like Paula and Stephanie would come home from school and say, oh, Sylvia's been talking shit about us at school. So then that would get her a beating. Yeah. It was really, like, to be fair, pathetic, petty... Do you know when we say to us kids, stop telling tales? Yeah. That's what it was like. So these attacks, as we know, started increasing and started getting a bit more vile. Violent? Yeah. I'm assuming. Yeah. Now, Gertrude would repeatedly kick Sylvia in her genitals. She put cigarettes out on her. She would just beat her with this paddle, like I said before. But then eventually other people got involved in this. And Paula would often take part in beating her. She'd take it in turns, forcing her to do unforgivable things in front of people. And also Paula's boyfriend would jump in on the action. So there's a lot of people that all know what's going on about this abuse. And nobody does fuck all about it. Um, Gertrude would starve her quite a lot. So she'd give her bare rations, then she'd force her to vomit and then force her to eat her own vomit. These fucking people need putting on an island somewhere. Yeah. Um, there were an occasion where Paula's boyfriend, he force fed her a hot dog, and they'd, like, added all these sauces and spices. And again, literally rammed it in a throw, made a vomit, and then forced her to eat it. Just awful fucking shit. And he put it on an island and left the rot. Oh, yeah, 100%. Gertrude's daughter, Paula, actually attacked Sylvia that bad, she broke her own wrist. And then because she broke her wrist and she had a cast on, she decided to use that cast. As a weapon. As a weapon. And to always, and, and to continue beating. Like a cunt. That she was. So, Gertrude would often accuse Sylvia of engaging in prostitution. She would deliver sermons to Paula... Uh, to Sylvia about how disgusting prostitution was 
and how women in general were disgusting. She often forced Jenny, her sister, to join in. If she refused, she'd then get a beating. Yeah. Now, there's another gentleman that comes into this called Coy. He was Stephanie's boyfriend. Him and a dozen of their classmates would go round to that house and they'd torment her. They'd basically... They'd all be sat around in the living room while she were forced to be sat in the middle of this room with all these eyes on her, just doing awful fucking things to her. They'd use her as a practice dummy for judo. Um, oh, and to entertain Gertrude, she forced her to strip naked. She forced her to then masturbate with a Coca-Cola bottle because there were glass bottles back then. Um, the bottle broke. She forced her to continue fucking hell with a broken glass bottle um this were all just to humiliate her in front of everybody and for their sick pleasure yeah as time went on she eventually stopped to go into school and i'm assuming that's because injuries were so fucking bad yeah that she weren't gonna get she wasn't gonna get away with it was she she just to give you an idea because i there's a lot of examples i could give you of on different of occasions of what they'd make her do, but they're fucking awful. So, as a bit of an idea, they'd burn all the fingertips with matches. They, like I said, they'd mas make her masturbate, make her strip off. They would beat her, just tormented. They'd put food in a little bowl in front of her when she was starving, and then tease it away from her. Just awful fucking physical and mental torture. Yeah, just breaking her, mm. completely breaking her. Now, her mum and dad did come back and visit, but on the last two occasions, they actually said they saw no like visible signs of abuse and the girls didn't come across as scared or terrified. They couldn't believe what, what uncovered. So when, the, when the, the dad came back, visited them and then just fucked off again? So they'd go travelling again, yeah. And the mum were out of prison by then? Yeah, and she joined the family yeah. travelling the carnival. So they did go and see the girls. Fucking take your kids, then, will you? But they didn't think anything was going wrong and the girls didn't say anything. But that being said, they were always watched by either Gertrude or one of the kids. Yeah. So that's probably why they didn't say anything. And on the last time that her mum left, Gertrude actually said to, Sil to Sylvia, what are you going to do now? They're gone. Who's going to save you? Fucking, or, like, you'd just want to run, wouldn't you? What a fucking piece of shit. Yeah. Now, in the September, Sylvia and Jenny actually saw their older sister, because don't forget they had older fem family members that didn't travel, but they were grown up, they got their own lives and their own kids. So they did actually see a sister, but they didn't, first occasion, they didn't tell her. And then the second occasion, they did tell her, but she didn't actually know where they were staying to like investigate or go follow it up. They just said that the people that she was staying with weren't very nice and that all this stuff were going on. And then they went. So I'm gonna tell you about one occasion and one incident that happened because I just think it's too awful to not tell you. So in the late September, <clears throat> Gertrude uh, basically it's this horrendous attack on Sylvia and this then brought more people into this. Right. So. She basically, again, was accusing Sylvia of engaging in gluttony. She then got Paula involved. They beat her, like, really, really badly beat her. They then decided that they were going to cleanse her soul of sin in scalding baths. Oh, so they that her. is fucking... Awful. They would repeatedly bang her head off the bath to bring her back round because she'd pass out with pain. So I know. Here's a good idea. Let's do Let's it. Let's just fucking bash your brain outside a bath. Dickheads. Yeah. Now, there was one gentleman that rang the skull and basically said, I, I want to report something. So he explained that there were a girl living at Gertrude's uh, address and she were covered in really bad open sores from head to toe. School followed up, they sent the school nurse out, but Gertrude completely fed him a load of bullshit, and actually con she convinced the school nurse that Sylvia was a really bad kid, that she just couldn't keep her on right track, she were running off all the time, and that actually all these sores on her body 
were because she'd ran away with a group of boys and she didn't keep up with any personal hygiene. So she basically said that she turned up looking that way. And did the nurse not even look at... No, 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 no. And that were it. Case closed. No one ever then questioned where she was after that. She obviously weren't attending school, so why no one fucking cared? Now, Gertrude's neighbours were called Raymond and Phyllis. They actually said (laughs) that at first they thought Gertrude would be this perfect person to take care of somebody's children. She always seemed like a really doting mum, that sort of thing. She had a lot of kids. A lot of kids. Um, But on two separate occasions, they actually did give a statement saying that they'd witnessed Paula abusing Sylvia and that she'd openly been bragging about what she was doing to her and that on the second occasion she was were really really weak but no one decided to report it so even the neighbours they sort of knew what was going on I don't get it but no one reported we're talking about 60s as well yeah so people can say it were a different time it were a different you era could, you know sm- that's on a different that's on a different them. level though it's absolute fucking bullshit yeah and to anyone who's listening to this without sounding like a cock, if you think a fucking kid's been abused, just fucking report it. Don't ever not. Even if you're wrong. Because imagine if you don't and this fucking happens. Yeah. You'd never be able to Because we're, s- we're saying this is in 60s. Yeah, this case is. But look how many cases yeah. nowadays that yeah. aren't. You yeah. know, that it still happens a fucking lot. Yeah. So... Yeah, so neighbours decided not to report it either. Now, their sister did eventually find out where they were staying and she tried to um, approach Gertrude, but what she actually did were ordered her off the land and basically said that your mum and dad said when they went away not to have it, let you have any contact, so off you fucking go. Shut door and refused point blank to let her see her sisters. Again, she didn't pursue it any further, she didn't try and not that i'm putting blame onto anyone else yeah. but there's a lot of missed red flags yeah. for me now by this point sylvia had actually become incontinent because of all the damage that had been caused to a genital area and a bladder and everything else from beatings she became in- incontinent now she weren't allowed to use bathroom she was barred from using bathroom she was forced to just wet herself humiliation in it it's just awful like I said, physical and mental torture. Yeah. But if she did then with herself, she then got punished. It were a never-ending fucking cycle for yeah. her. So there were an occasion um, in October where Gertrude decided, you know what, I'm fucking sick of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to lock you down in my basement because you keep pissing bed and I can't be arsed with changing bedding, basically. So she tied her up. Um, she wore often naked again. The starvation were took up a massive level. She was basically left down there. On it time she had interaction what to be abused or to be tortured. This is what I mean when I say these people should be put on an island and left to rot. Left. Because Starve they, yourself. Yeah. What they're doing to these people is kind of leaving them to rot. Yeah. But obviously with physical abuse and all that tied in. And that's what I mean when they say, when I say they should be put on an island and left a fucking rot. Yep, you experience what it feels like, yeah. dickhead. So, like I said, abuse had massively ramped up. It had got to a point where any of the kids in local area that attended that school, if they wanted to come and attack her or torture her or, you know, humiliate her, they could at a charge of five cents each. So she were also making money from this. Mm. Throughout the time locked in the basement, with help from all the kids, their boyfriends, local kids, they'd basically restrain her. They'd repeat the scolding baths. There wants to be a fucking lot of arrests at the end of this story. They, they then would rub salt into her open wounds. That, for me, was the th- worst thing that stood out like there's a lot of bad shit that happens in here Mm. but an open wound with salt rubbed in and this girl was covered it's just fucking awful obviously the this girl would cry and scream but they'd often shove cloth in her mouth tape it up they would get the once made the 11 year old son take a nappy 
from the little baby and smeared it into her face. It were covered in shit and wee and just awful. Just awful. Cruelty. It's, it's like these people who do this, to do it for their own amusement, it's like they treat a human being like a fucking toy. Yeah. That they can poke and prod, prod yeah. bend this way. We, we, full control, isn't it? Mm. That's why it is. You're a puppet on strings. Fucking this bitch needs putting down. 100%. Well, wait wait till I get to the sentencing, mate. Um, <laughs> eventually, she started letting Sylvia sleep upstairs again. Um, didn't last right long because of the incontinence. Um, again, she was forced to stand in the living room. She was forced to masturbate with a bottle in front of a room full of fucking kids, her kids, herself. She was then made to go back into the basement, tied up again, starved. She'd also, she, she'd do a lot of these sermons and sort of rants, not just to Sylvie, but to, from what I gather, there were very big church and faith believers. Yeah. Now, again, I said it were a lot of tit for tat on one occasion, and this is probably the worst, so I'll give a bit of a warning. Because I've had a moan before about not warning people. I'm ready. Now, Gertrude had got in her head that Sylvia was causing all these tit-for-tat lying about her family and her kids. That she decided that you've branded my daughters, I'm now going to brand you. So she dragged her to the kitchen and with a hot needle, she basically carved across her stomach. I am a prostitute, I'm proud of it. I'm not ready. In big, <laughs> I want to get off. Stop. In really big fucking letters. Now, it weren't just her that did this. She got a few of the local boys to do some lettering. You know, it, very convenient that she's never alone in this, isn't it? Mm. It's always um, these young children that... That she can control as well. Yeah, yeah. After she did that, um, after the, they all did that, sorry, she were then sent back down to the basement where her 10-year-old daughter decided that she wanted to brand her and she wanted to brand her with an S, a really big S. But she actually did a number three, which this is a really famous picture from this case. On purpose? No. She thought it was an S and it was She was trying... Three. So what she did is she used a ball and she was hoping by warming up the sides that she could... She should have done one that way then turned it over she so it created... It, no, she shouldn't. No, no, she shouldn't have done it at all. But what I meant is, but in her head she did it wrong, so it created a number five. Oh, the a number, bitch. Yeah, a number three, sorry. It's a really famous photo to do with this, um, this case. So that night is the night that Sylvia basically said to her sister, I know you don't want to wear it, but I'm going to fucking die. They're going to kill me here. Yeah. She, she fucking knew. And I think... I think she probably knew mentally as well because there's only so much the body, the body can take. And the brain can only take so much. Yeah. Now, next day, Gertrude woke her up and forced her to write a letter. And she forced her to write this letter to basically use to cover her own back. She made her write in this letter that she was running away with... A, the circus. <laughs> a, no, not quite, but a gang of local boys. Yeah. She basically were running away. She didn't want anyone to find her. Um, she didn't want anyone to find her. She's sorry she's been gone for so long, whatever. Um, but these local boys have caused these horrific injuries to my body, right? So mm -hmm. this is what this letter says. So <laughs> Sylvia overheard Gertrude finalising the plan. And that plan was to get Jenny and her son John to blindfold her, take her into this local woods and basically leave her there, dump her there to die. Um, they obviously knew by this point she were really fucking weak. So it probably weren't going to take long. More than a night in woods. Yeah, alone. So anyway, because cause Sylvia had overheard this, regardless of how weak she was, she thought she'd attempt to try and make an escape. She basically screamed and screamed and banged on them fucking walls in basement as much as she could for as long as she could. Um, Neighbours did say that they did hear this, but they didn't think to ring police because it soon stopped. Now... But it depends on what you fucking heard. Like, if I hear a woman screaming and then it stops, I still... I'm gonna think what the fuck's happening. Well, you're gonna you're gonna listen, thinking why she stopped so suddenly. You'd you'd want to know, wouldn't yeah. you? So there's a reason that that had stopped, 
And that was because on the morning of the 26th... They killed her. Yeah, unfortunately. And this this had happened... That What had happened, they killed her. They basically um, dragged her back up to the kitchen out of basement. Gertrude decided to prop her up against wall and attempted to feed her a donut. But because of how dehydrated she was, how weak she was, she had so much damage, you know, to her throat, mm. she couldn't she couldn't swallow. No. So it fucking wound Gertrude up and she decided to launch this massive attack on her. And she ended that attack by stomping on her head, basically, repeatedly. Now, Stephanie, the other daughter, she thought she'd passed out, so she decided to baff her to try and bring her round. But she soon realised that she fucking won't. Yeah. passed out she she were dead so she was she attempted cpr but gertrude just basically started shouting she's fucking faking it she's faking it she'll come back round and she continued to try fucking smacking her <sighs> while her daughter's attempting cpr what a cunt you don't use that word very often no but this woman fucking deserves it oh yeah so she then soon realized that she weren't faking it either. And she told Richard, who was the boyfriend, to basically go in place from a near pay, uh, nearby payphone and tell him what's happened, that they found her dead. So when police came, she took them to the bedroom where Sylvia had been put. The police said that, you know, the mattress were disgusting. I'm surprised that, they fucking found the police, to be honest. Yeah. But this woman, don't forget... Is fucking crafty because when the police arrived, she handed him the letter. And said, oh, she's been, I don't know where she's been. She'd just come back like this. She turned up. This is exactly what she did. She basically ran away, not seen her for a while. She's turned up this afternoon, handed me this note. She looks in this horrific state. We've been taking care of her all afternoon. We've baffed her to clean her up. We've all this. Bullshit. Bollocks. Now, when they originally asked Jenny, the sister, it were a very rehearsed statement that she gave. Probably under eye as well. Under, yeah. Uh, she were always watched. But that being said, she did manage to whisper to one of the police officers, if you get me out of this house, I'll tell you everything. Well done, girl. So that's exactly what she did. And Jenny gave a full statement about from beginning to end, how it all escalated and how they eventually killed her. So Gertrude, Stephanie, Paula and John was all arrested within hours of suspicion of murder. Later that day, Coy and Richard was also arrested. They're the two boyfriends of the yeah. daughters. They were also arrested. Now, at first, Gertrude, of course, completely denies everything. She blames everybody else. Apparently, she, she sort of knew it was going on, but she was too depressed to do anything and she basically didn't have control of her children, is she, what she said. She blamed it on her own kids. She was willing to, to fucking chuck her own kids yeah. under the bus to save herself. <laughs> She's lovely. Uh, have you ever seen a picture of her? No. Wait till you see her face. Is she fit? Fuck off. Is she ugly? Uh, no, because I'd never say only one's ugly, but she's scary looking. Right. So let I'll show you that once I've finished this. Um, so, yeah, she completely denied it. I'm going to say one foot wank bank. Not at all. <laughs> Why, but I can't wait for these guys to now hear your reaction after that statement's come out of your mouth. That's going to be fun. Um, yeah, she actually stated that Paula, the daughter, had caused most of the damage. She was one that did everything. Um, and she only actually made her sleep in the basement three times, but that was because um, she kept weeing the, weeing the bed and she couldn't afford to keep washing the bed in. So she admitted to that. Now, Paula, absolute zero remorse, signed a statement, basically admitting to her involvement. John also admitted his part, stating that he did often spank, punch and burn her with matches and things like that. Then there were five local children that also was arrested and charged with causing injury to a person. In court, the autopsy revealed that Sylvia had over 150 separate wounds 
across her body basically including burns severe bruising extensive muscle and nerve damage yeah her vagina were almost swollen shut all internal damage her fingernails were broken backwards most of the top layer of her skin on her face chest and neck were gone that fucking poor girl yeah just unbelievable awful things now charges against the other daughter stephanie were dropped due to lack of evidence but she did agree to testify against the family uh, well her family in court um the trial lasted 17 days gertrude was convicted of first degree murder richard john and coy were all convicted of manslaughter they did 18 months at a juvenile centre Paula actually had her charge dropped to voluntary manslaughter and her sentence then got reduced and do you want to know how long that woman served? that girl served? three fucking years three years for her involvement fucking joke yeah now ironically Richard died of lung cancer at 21 years old. Coy spent the rest of his adult life in and out of prison and he died of an heart attack at 56. There were a retrial and Gertrude's sentence also got reduced and she was still convicted of first degree murder but it was changed to 18 years. And funny enough, she turned out to be this model fucking prisoner that everyone called mum. She was kind and caring. And she ended up, her parole came in 1985 and she was released. She changed her name. Please tell me she died a horrible death. Like got knocked over by a, a bus and then the bus drags her down the street. All right. And then a four wheeler comes and runs her over. And then something fucking else happens to her. Please tell me. No, mate. I wish I could. But she was released and she then changed her name uh, to Nadine Van Fossen. She actually only lived five years and she died of lung cancer in 1990. So she fucking deserved it. A lot. She deserved a lot worse than that. Paula, she also changed her name. She moved. And do you know what that woman became? A fucking teacher. Wow. I kid you not. She was a teacher. How? Because she changed her name. But don't forget, you know, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. there weren't these massive DBSs that there is now. She did eventually, they did eventually clock on and she did eventually get struck off. Well, so she weren't able to Tell me that teach. she died a horrible death, like get by a crocodile or something. Alive. She's still alive. Well, I hope she gets set by a crocodile. Um, so, John also changed his name. That was one of her sons as well. He actually became a minister and he often worked um, counselling young offenders. Fuck! Oh. Honestly, he actually did. Which is fucking... I don't... I don't. Well, people reform, so they say. And I've got to admit, you know, these, these were just kids. So... These had a massive influence from their mum oh, yeah. when this happened. Yeah. I know they would have known it was wrong, yeah. but imagine if her own kids were actually, as awful as this is going to sound, quite relieved that someone else were getting attacked and not them. Because we don't know what were going off in that yeah. house before. You never know what happens behind closed doors. No. Not that I'm justifying anything, but you know it's just a spin on it. Um, Jenny went on to marry and have kids. Um, she actually did an interview which I watched on YouTube. Oh, my foot's gone dead. And she said that she ne- like there were never having any blame put on her parents or anything like that because they knew that they were just trying their best to make ends meet and it was just an awful thing that happened. So, yeah, that is the story of Sylvia Likens. And the film is actually called An American Crime. Mm. On, I think it's on Prime, so we will have to watch it. Yeah, so if anyone else watches it, let us know what you think. Yeah, please do. 
We hope you've enjoyed episode 13. It is. We will back. And we'll be on time this time. This time, this time? We'll be on time this time. Okay. <laughs> I don't get you. <laughs> no, it just sounded funny. We'll be, we'll have this episode out on time. This time. Perfect. <laughs> well, it's only, to be fair, it's one episode. Yeah. That's it. So Carla's going to show me. Oh. Me, uh, latest entry to. Not, not at all. <laughs> Are you ready? Come on. Fuck off. That is not what I expected. <laughs> Do you know what I mean by scary looking though? Like I don't think I'd have backchatted her as a kid. She looks like a cunt. Don't she? Yeah. For anyone that hadn't already Googled the picture, I'll... She looks like a right miserable bitch as well. Yeah, that's what I mean. If she lived on my street when I were a kid, that's definitely one garden I did not want my ball getting in. You won't be kicking your fucking football in her garden. No, no. She's fit though. Fuck you. <laughs> no, she's not. Um, so that's a wrap. Hope you've enjoyed it. See you later.